Hello Poetry Pals, welcome back to another video. This week I am here with Bridget from Burning Eye Books and we are talking about how to get published and Burning Eye and everything like that. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm good thanks. Yeah, I'm good. So tell me about yourself and poetry in general first of all and how you sort of got into that or whatever. Um. Well, I won't start at the very beginning because everyone's got, I wrote teenage moody poetry. <laughs> Everyone did that. Um, I got into performance poetry when I was uh, at uni. Um, I started the Poetry Society at Southampton University. Um, and then I started getting more involved in the poetry scene out, outside of the university and in the city mm -hmm. because I had grown up in the city, so it was a bit easier. Um, and I started doing like event coordination and like, I did a couple of slams and I started kind of rising through the ranks in Southampton in the small scene that was there. Um, and then <clears throat> and then after uni I moved to Bristol and I was sort of doing like zero hour contract jobs. Mm -hmm. Like at one point I was doing like four jobs or something ridiculous um, for very little money. Um, and then one day I get a, a message from Pete Hunter who works for Apples and Snakes for the Southwest region. Um, and he was like, Clive from from Burning Eye Books is looking for someone to help them two days a week, like doing admin and things. And I was like, I can do admin and things. And I know the poetry scene quite well. Um, um, so I was like, oh, that would be really cool. Um, and in the meantime, I was doing like featured sets around Bristol. Um, I was uh, producing poetry zines that I would sell at punk shows, which is predominantly where I perform poetry. Um, and going on like DIY tours with other poets and bands and things. Uh, so that was really cool. And then, yeah, I just sort of met Clive and uh, it sort of, I was like, oh, moving to Bristol was the right thing to do. <laughs> so how long have you been at Burning Eye Books then? I think it's four, no, five years now. It will be five years in June this year. And Burning Eye Books is not that much older than that, is it? It's our... It's technically our 10th birthday next year. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah, we're going to have a big party. So you should all come. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll be there. Well, we'll yeah, be there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you started doing admin and now you're editor? What's your, what's your job? What, what's your job title now? And how did that change happen? Um, so yeah, I started off doing like two days a week, um, just doing a bit of admin, mostly social media things, um, which as you know, I detest. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, it, yeah, so I would go over to Clive's house in Portishead one day a week and we would like work together and he would teach me about um, advanced information and book titles and like, you know, t he started to teach me the database and... Um, you know, I would do things like send the books off to the uh, National Poetry Library and things because you have to send copies of every book that you publish to the National Poetry Library, Scotland and England. Wow. Um, it's a lot of admin that I often got wrong, I'm not <laughs> going to lie. Um, again, not much on point, apparently, counting. Um, uh, and then I kind of stopped doing some of the other jobs that I was doing because they were just not financially supporting me and I just wasn't getting anything out of them. Um, one I got fired from, yes. Um, and then I was like, I, I think I need to work another day a week. So then I started working another day a week. Um, Clive's an amazing person because everything, every bit of money that Burning Eye makes goes into paying me um, my wage every month. Mm. And I'm eternally grateful for that. So I just started getting more and more involved. And I think Clive wanted somebody to take over more of the daily grind of things yeah. so that he could concentrate on doing more of the kind of business kind of side of thing, the financial side, which I don't understand. Um, so he started teaching me how to do the schedule and then one year I just started running the schedule and then every year I've been, you know, ironing out the kinks of the schedule ever, ever since then. Right. So that's been about three years I've been doing the, the schedule. And the schedule is like... Um, what we mean by when we say that the list of titles that are coming out this, this year. So my job is to project manage those titles from submissions, from accepting submissions all the way to post-publication. So it's my job to track yeah. all of them and keep people on the right path and keeping to their deadline, deadlines and things like that. So I'm basically a big PR, PA person for yeah. about 20 poets a year. <laughs> I think 
We'll ask more about like the schedule because when when I hear the word schedule from working in social media, I'm like, oh, so yeah, you know the social media schedule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll ask more about that in a bit, but um, the the thing that I know that I found most fascinating when I was working with Burning Eye was the you know the submission process and and how that worked. So can you tell me a bit about um, the submission process at Burning Eye and how that all works? So. Um... We have open call submissions, which means that the submissions window is open to anyone wanting to submit. We do that uh, every other year. Um, so the people that are coming through and releasing their titles in 2020 came through in 2018 on, uh, 2019, sorry, on the, um, the open call submissions. So they were selected last year um, for the 2020 list. We do this every other year because it's we get a, a huge number of submissions um, and it's quite a lot of work to do. And also it gives us the opportunity to have a good balance between writers that we curate for the list and new people that we might not necessarily have heard of or um, people that come through through different channels and we really like their work, which is quite nice. So in the open call submissions, yes. um, how many did you get in 2019? 2019, I think it was about 80... Yeah, about 80 submissions, okay. which is a lot less than other presses, but that's because we have a vetting system. Um, one of the things that Clive talks about in his interview with Apples and Snakes... Is, which is linked below. <laughs> which is linked below. Um, <laughs> Hashtag YouTube. <laughs> yeah. It's all new to me, I don't know. Um, is, or, you know, you have to follow the instructions down to, like, a T, basically. Mm. Any press will tell you that. Mm -hmm. um, so we've, you know, you have to, you have to seriously want to you have to jump through a lot of hoops to submit to us in the first place and we charge a fee of five pounds which goes to a charitable cause um when the submission windows closes mm -hmm. um just so that we know that people are serious because um we get a lot of in the past we've had a lot of just blanket submissions that are like dear publisher instead yeah. of it being personal and part of the submissions process is that we ask you what your favorite burning eye book is yeah um, i like and that. why um, yeah, I saw that last year and I was sort of I had half a collection together and almost did it you know when you're yeah. like oh. and I knew that I could answer all the questions and stuff like that I think it's really interesting that you charge five pounds and I know that um, in a previous video I've done about submitting and how to submit your mm. poems um, I've said that uh, largely I'm talking about magazines and journals yeah. who charge for submissions. Um, I think that's not necessarily right and it can sometimes, you know, get in the way for working class poets and stuff like that. But yeah. your reasoning behind charging £5 for this, I think is really a good yeah. thing. I mean, if you think about some of the prizes and competitions, yeah. you're, you're submitting one poem for £5. Or at, 12 or sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, um, you know, at Burning Eye, it's like you send us a pamphlet or a full collection, so that's at least 15 poems that you're sending us for yeah. five pounds. And we don't keep the money, the money goes to a charitable cause at the end. Yeah. Um, we, we only do it so that we can uh, get people that are really serious about it, and if they can't afford it for any reason, um, then our email is at the bottom of the submission so that you can get in touch with us and yeah. we can um, some, uh, arrange something privately, that's fine. Yeah. Nice. I like the fact that you have this vetting process and asking people for your favourite Burning Eye book because one thing that I haven't really asked about is obviously Burning Eye books has got a specific, I'm going to say vibe, but like <laughs> genre of poets that you publish. Obviously, you know, spoken word and performance poets and stuff like that. Mm. And so, you know, with blanket submissions where you just get, I don't know, who these people are just sat in their bedrooms applying for every open call or something and yeah. not even reading the submission guidelines. Yeah, that's um, really hard to, to... It's a waste of time, basically. Yeah. yeah. It's a real waste of time. So how many would you get if you didn't... If you counted all those ones that don't meet the criteria? Probably about 400 oh, or something. There's a couple... There's a, a pre, There's a press, another press that I've been talking to about their submissions. Um, and they just have their email address. Please send your poems to this with a covering letter and and they get inundated with submissions because they've they've made it too easy for themselves yeah you know and and people do they they'll they don't care who they be published by which is why we ask who your favorite burning eye author is because we like to be 
schmoozed a bit you know we want to know that you like our press and yeah. that you want to be part of the press you want some romance in yeah <laughs> and the other thing that we ask for is a bit of performance history so we want to know in your biography um you know what performances you've done where you've done them who you've supported who you've toured with um because like you say we're a, a performance poetry press mm. so if you submit to us and your poems are really good, but you're not a performance poet, that will affect our overall decision right. about whether or not we publish you. Because we, our publishing model is designed for touring artists, for them to sell their own merchandise. That's kind of, We're like a glorified merch desk, basically. Mm. So, you've got your 18 <coughs> submissions, you're reading through them. What are you looking for? Um individuality mm -hmm. to subjects um i think we live in a time of identity politics and i think people can get really stuck behind uh the the labels in which other people have given them or they might be giving themselves um but there's there's a, a, a good poetry has a genuine voice in there you know whether you're talking about those issues or not and i think if i can find that voice in the things that you're you're talking about then that's what I'm looking for I'm looking for somebody that, that knows themselves that knows their writing that isn't afraid to maybe experiment um who maybe looks at subjects you know you know off off camera or like you know at a different angle yeah that's that's more interesting than you know 11 poems about being a lesbian mm -hmm. in school which we all have poems about <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know it's a uh, uh, I don't know, I, I like to read um, work that is, I, I, li I quite, personally I quite like narrative stuff, so I like to be told a story, I like concept poetry collections that Ooh. take you somewhere from beginning to end, Ooh. I really admire people's ability to be able to write on on that kind of subject like that, like mm -hmm. you're, you have a really good book like that that I've enjoyed in the past, <laughs> plug plug, <laughs> um, and I, um, I look for people that are keen that want to know more they want to learn more they want to get to the next step of their career and especially for burning eye because we're such a community-based um press mm -hmm. we we want to know i want to know that you're involved in your community yeah that you you are volunteering at an open mic night or you're doing a poetry podcast or a youtube channel mm -hmm. or you know there's there's something else going on that that makes you part of the community and, and makes you passionate about that community yeah what shouldn't someone do? So someone submitted, they've got through, they've, you know, they've obeyed the submission mm. guidelines. So that's number thing that... Yeah, well done. Yeah. <laughs> so number one thing not to do is not read the submission guidelines. Uh, well, yeah, that is the beginning bit. But so they get through that. What is something that you don't look for? Or actively you read this or whatever and you're like, no, get out. Um, rape jokes. Good shout, yes. I, it would maybe shock you to know how many collections people have sent me um, with uh, rape poems in or uh, poems that insinuate sexual assault or some kind of assault of a woman. Um, homophobic poetry is another one that I have turned down. Um, I'm, I'm very strict. The, it says on our submissions that, um, you know, in a time uh, where you have to fight you stand up for what you believe in that's what we're doing yeah. and that's what we expect of our writers we expect you to have integrity um and we don't take bigotry of any kind yeah. lightly it's i really don't mm. i um I have an activist background and i come from an anarchist background and that's something that i just i can't really stand or make excuses for with anybody mm. totally um, I really like the phrasing on the website because it's got the phrase, we do not take kindly to. And yeah. the rest of the sentence is like, <laughs> super head, we do not take kindly to this. Yeah, Cl Clive wrote the submissions letter, so I he's very it. polite about it. <laughs> I think if it was me, there'd be a lot more yeah. F's and curses and, um, and, and things. Okay, <laughs> so like, that's obviously some really big stuff, but is there any like maybe even just stylistic stuff that just niggles at you? Just uh, you personally, maybe you've just got a little thing where it's like, mm. not maybe subject matter wise, but like I'm not a huge fan of rhyme. I think I think 
especially when you're the kind of person that rhymes tree with poetry. Please don't. Please don't do that. And actually, on that subject, I don't really like poems that are about poetry. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, when the poem is about how much you love poetry, I like, I don't like things like that. It, 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 I feel like it, it really takes me out of it. Yeah. And like, but have you written one, though? No, I've never written one. You've never written I've one? I've never written a poem about poetry. Um, which is... Oh, wait, maybe, I totally have. Yeah. Know. I mean, I think I've probably mentioned poetry in something. Like, yeah. Um, I wrote a sonnet about a sonnet. That's how... A sonnet squared, is that Yeah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I think unless unless you, you're coming from some really innovative way of doing it that's going to be like, wow, that's amazing. If it's just a standard poem about poetry, don't send it to a publisher because we don't need to be told why, why poetry is great. Yeah. Because we're in the business. And we've already read a lot of those poems. Yeah, we really have. Yeah. Um, uh, I think... I mean, really think about, if you're going to submit to a press, really think about how you're laying your word out on the page, especially if you're a spoken word artist. Yeah. Because you could uh, you could write down all of your words in block paragraphs in a notebook, but you're going to have to type that up and put that into some kind of form yeah. before you send it to us, because there's no way that I'm going to sit there reading block paragraphs and paragraphs of poetry um, and trying to figure out where the line breaks is. Um, and there are plenty of ways for you to, uh, plenty of resources online, and you know, I'm sure you've got some videos mm-hmm. of like how to like lay out a page and like experiment with the page and, you know, just have fun with it, you know, let, let the page be your canvas, mm. if you like, you know. I think, you know, there are room, there, there is room in the world for poems that are like prose poems mm. that just sort of like run straight across the page. Yeah. And like there is also room, my thing's punctuation. Yeah, but like it, you know, there is also room for poetry that doesn't have any punctuation. It's just one big like run-on thing. But the thing that gets to me, and I don't edit anyone's poetry. This is just a personal thing. Is if that is a conscious, de- it has to be a decision that you've made, mm. not just because oh that's just how I wrote it. But like, why are you choosing to present those words in that way? Yeah, and if it's a conscious decision, then I think then that's fine. But. Yeah, I mean, here is a top tip from our copy editor, Harriet, okay? Uh, yeah. So, if you've got a, a full stop at the end of your poem, you put punctuation throughout the whole thing. Um, if you if you don't want punctuation, don't put any punctuation, not even a full stop in there, you know? The only thing that you might be allowed, or some people allow, is capital letters, um, you know, at the start of a new stanza or, or, or whatever it is. But um, that, that that's it, basically. It's either all of it or none of it. That's, mm. that's where you've got to go with it, really. My lecturer, when I was doing my master's, convinced me to write a poem where it started really punctuated and then the punctuation slowly faded away to show the breakdown of my psyche through it. Okay. And it kind of works, but my God, I spent so long agonising over which was a stronger punctuation mark, a comma or a semicolon. It, it got deep. Anyway, enough about that. Um, so... They've submitted, mm-hmm. you've loved it. Okay. You're like, yeah, we're gonna publish this. Tell me about the schedule and uh, almost take me through the journey of a poetry collection from the moment it's been accepted to the moment it's out in the world. Okay. Um, uh, no rush. <laughs> no rush. Okay, so um, a book gets accepted for publication on the... 1st of April 2020 um, and they want to publish the book in March 2021 great um, so after we've accepted it we'll send you all the information that you need the timeline the schedule and everything the next important date that you need to to work towards is the 1st of August because that's when I need your advanced information your advanced information is your finalized title a temporary book cover blurb and a bio and any quotes that you might have um, because this information goes off to all of the booksellers um, and our distributors in press also take the information and they print it in the magazine um, which goes to like Waterstones and other bookshops so you'll want to that you know that's that's a bit of time how many months is that so that's Five. April to August April, May, June, July, August four four months so that's four months you've got to get that information to 
to me. So that's the final of everything. If you don't send this to me, then I can't put your book in the catalogue. And that is a that is a, one of our key ways of promoting you. Um, because Impress take it out to the, the local indie bookshops and they choose their titles that they want to pre-order and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, the 1st of August is also the date that you will need to hand in your manuscript. So there's four months between being accepted and, and handing in your final manuscript. Depending on what month in the following year you want to, to publish in, you may have longer to do some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it takes, uh, so that's like um, six, seven months before the publication date. In that time, your text will be edited by uh, Harriet, our copy editor, she's great. And then will be typeset, which means that the, it will go from being just a Word document into being a book we, which we design on InDesign. And we yeah. add all the fancy text and the page breaks and you know images, if you've got images. Um, and then it goes to print. Um, and ideally you should have your books three weeks before the release date. Um, but that's only if you stick to your schedule and your deadlines. Because people don't often do that, do they? No, poets. I mean, surprisingly. <laughs> I mean, I think, it, yeah. Uh, some They're people, too busy having feelings. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> some people are fine and they get it done. Yeah. Um, because I, 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 And usually those are the people that have submitted a full manuscript to us. They, they're like, my book's done. This is what it is. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. Um, it's Love Island season, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, and I didn't get that. No, it's so. fine, it's fine. I, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> Um, uh, what was I saying? So, uh, if they submit with a full manuscript, generally they're the ones who are fine less and likely they, to yeah, make they, changes. They don't need so much help. But we we do have writers that come to us and they're like, "I've got an idea for a book. I want to talk to you about it. You know, I've got some poems." And generally, those are the people that I work more one on one with mm -hmm. um, to get a manuscript up to scratch so that we can move it forward to the next stage. And those are usually people that we invite to submit or people that are burning eye poets already who mm -hmm. are coming back from another collection. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. I want to ask you a question about a very specific book. Okay. And if you don't want to answer it, we'll just cut this out and that's fine. Okay. Um, I think I know which book this is about. No, no. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I want to ask about Stephen Lightbound's book mm -hmm. because I know that uh, before... Was he part of the open submission process? Yes. And I know that he was having uh, mentoring from Rebecca Tantoni. Yeah. Um, about, you know, building a collection and stuff. And his, I've reviewed his book on my channel before. Okay. And it has the, those beautiful sections and I love it. It's honestly one of, it, that's my favorite Burning Eye book. Yeah. Sorry to anyone who thought it was yours. <laughs> um, but, uh, when how did that come in? Did it look like that when it came in in no. those sections? Really? No. So uh, Stephen's original submission, I encouraged him to go away and have mentoring with somebody that he uh, uh, trusted in the Bristol scene or someone that he could he knew that he would work with quite well. Yeah. And Stephen's a very proactive poet. Like he oh. puts his work first and he, he values what do he's something. doing. Yeah. Boom, done. So that's what something that we also encourage. Like if we like your work, we see the potential. Um, we don't have the budget to be able to, you know, set up mentoring without Arts Council funding, which we don't currently have. Mm. Um, so we really encourage Stephen to go away and work with another poet to um, make the poetry more succinct um, and more stylistic um, in its approach to what he was talking about. Mm -hmm. But obviously the subject matter that he's talking about, the heart of it was there, you know, it yeah. just needed a bit of a sweep up. Mm -hmm. um, and then... So I think he worked with Rebecca and then he came back to us with the with the finished manuscript and then it went to Harriet. Um, but I think it came to us in the sections like yeah. that, that I think he'd worked through with Rebecca. Those sections, oh. Yeah. I, it's full on chef's kiss. You know, I would encourage anyone that's got a manuscript up together that maybe even before you send it to a publisher, you get some peers or people that you trust to look over your work and give it an edit or give you some feedback um, so that you can make sure that you're really putting your best work forward in a submission. Mm. Um, so we've, you've submitted it, it's gone, it's gone into the impress thing, Harriet's edited it, it's gone to print. And now I just wanna ask, cause I think Burning Eye being a small indie press has a bit of a different vibe in terms of marketing 
uh, people's books and stuff like that. As you yeah. said, it's your model is based on touring artists selling their own books. So I wondered if you could um, tell us about the poets that do best at Burning Eye. So what did they okay. do? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, like I was just mentioning with Stephen, like, you get the poets that are a real driving force for their own work. So, um, actually, Clive and I were talking about this yesterday. Um, Laurie Bulger has sold over a thousand copies of her book, Box Rooms, which came out in 2015. She's still buying boxes of books a hundred at a time to sell. Wow. Um, which we would say would be like, that's our, that's our star model. Um, so just to clarify, they bought the poet buy books off you at, at a cost yeah, price, a discounted price, yeah, um, from us, and then and then they they sell the book. So they buy it at cost price for us about I think it's fifty percent, yeah, um, and then obviously they sell it for a profit, yeah, and things like that. So we, it's quite a it's quite an easy model for us, and it's a practical one because without arts council funding, which when we did have it, we had Josie um, and Shagufta Iqbal. Um, working with us but when we don't have arts council funding it's just me and Clive um, and Clive only works one day a week because he has another business and I work four days a week um, so I basically do three people's jobs mm. um, and the mark I'm not going to lie marketing and social media is not high up on my priority when I've got to get all of these books published a lot of the time mm. so I really um, value poets that can that know how to market themselves that aren't afraid to put themselves out there. Sharif Energy is an amazing example of somebody whose book came out in November, Galaxy Walk, and she has been all over the place and has sold loads and loads of copies of her book, and she's really getting herself out there. Um, and that's the impetus that we want to put. We want uh, performing artists to have their own autonomy with their work. Mm -hmm. um, we don't want to, uh, you know, professionalise spoken word in a way that maybe other the scene is kind of moving. We want it to still be within the hands of the artist to promote themselves. Um, so yeah, I think it's um, I think it's a good balance between uh, being visible and active in the poetry scene. Touring is obviously quite a nice one. Um, uh, but there was uh, we had a, a, a strange well, not strange the strange case of Emily Harrison the other day <laughs> where. Um, <laughs> Someone had found a poem that she'd written in a zine in a block of flats. And this person happened to be an influencer. Is this the the, the lighter on the... Yeah. 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 This was when I was working there. So she... Uh, um, so this poem was picked up by a uh, influencer with loads of followers. And she had she bought Emily's book and then retweeted the book. And we sold, like, a ridiculous amount of copies in, like, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Of, just off the back of that, um, which was amazing. So thank you very much for that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, and actually this meeting I was in the other day was talking about the importance of influence and things like that. But both Clive and I are, like, you know, over 30 and don't quite know what an influencer is, if I'm honest. Could you tell me? <sighs> the camera cut out. We don't know when it stopped. Uh, Bridget was asking me about what an influencer is and I'm trying my best to not fuck it up. Um, an influencer is someone who's like on the internet, has built up a platform and can u of followers and can use their social media to influence people. Right. And so you have people on the internet who can make full-time careers out of just posting on Instagram. So a big example is Kim Kardashian. She'll get paid a lot of money to post about a product right so that's why love islanders will oh, when they yeah. leave love island they'll be like oh my god look at this teeth whitening thing and they'll have just got paid money to do that i love that Josie just explained that to me in terms that i would understand <laughs> because i do watch love island and i am not ashamed I'm not ashamed but yeah, so I think there's like the sort of broad term of influencer is just someone who has a platform and can use it to influence people. Yeah. And there are people who have, do that as a career. Yeah, so it was, it, so that doesn't happen very often, but when no. it does, it's it's quite nice, you yeah. know. Um, you know, it's, it's um, we've had a couple of people that get um, book sales or sort of uh, uh, vloggers. Did I say that right? Vloggers? Yeah. Book vloggers. Um which is quite nice, which is, yeah. which, which is really nice. Um, but a lot of it is to do with uh, 
like keeping it up because you know you'll get your initial print run and you'll sell like you know maybe 100 copies to like you know first people you go on tour with and like everybody that you know including your hairdresser yeah um and your dog might have a copy you don't know yeah um and then and then it will start to slow down a bit because the obviously the further you get from the launch of your book the the more work that you have to put into to getting it sorted but that all comes with like marketing yourself which you should know how to do if you've submitted to us and you've been successful yeah yeah um but we do um so last year we uh, Josie came and did some webinars for us um to teach some of our poets how to utilize their social media accounts um because quite honestly marketing is me on twitter on a thursday kind yeah. of scheduling everything in Josie gave me a really good schedule thing I love a good schedule mm-hmm. um, which I've been using by the way yeah <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's been really cool um, but yeah I mean these are all kind of just tricks of the trade really that you get more used to the, the longer you've been doing it I think I think as well so there's one thing I've learned through like working in marketing or social media in anything that I've ever done whether it's been with Burning Eye about poetry or you know at the Students Union um, the easiest way to get anyone to do anything whether that's buy something or go to something or do whatever is uh, to talk to them and word of mouth yeah so like if you like have a book and someone reads it and they really like it they're they're like gonna recommend it to other people and that's like the impetus like getting out and performing in front of people rather than sort of like being on social media yeah performing in front of people is the most effective way for you to sell your books yeah absolutely 100% um uh and uh what laurie does as well um is she sells tote bags with uh quotes from her book on and uh nice little um like beer mats as well because mm. some of her poems take place in pu- in pubs mm. um and it you it's know really nice idea. i mean you don't have to do that if you can't afford to do things like that and then it's totally fine when i had a book published i printed a limited edition um enamel pin of the snarling mouse on the front of my book so that went to the first 50 people that bought the book um, and everyone's and jealous because they didn't get one. Yeah. <laughs> De- definitely um, experiencing that right now. Yeah, but it was, that was really useful because my book was a pamphlet, so my book was an awkward £7, so I did the badge and the book for £10. Nice. Um, so that, you know, it's just like little things that add on to like, you know, what story are you telling in the book? How can you best utilise that with, you yeah. know, maybe tote bags or pencil cases or, or whatever it is. I know that Jess Green is someone who does that quite oh, well Oh, Jess well. Green is a machine. Um, we love Jess, obviously. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's somebody that, that uh, plugs in all kinds of ways. And I think, obviously, because uh, Jess is a book that came out with us a few years ago, uh, a self-help guide to being in love with Jeremy Corbyn. I think, you know, it was a real buzz because of the title. Yeah. Like, we actually got a fair bit of, um, like, fascist abuse on our Facebook page because... Yeah. We were we were publishing a book that promoted Jeremy Corbyn, mm. which was uh, pretty funny. Um, but we, we, on the back of that title, you know, Jess like sold tote bags and everything with like, you know a silhouette of JC on it, and yeah. it was just it yeah, it was like people lapped it up, they loved it. Um, you know, she does like labour fundraisers and things with it. So you really find your niche, find your story, find your people that your story's about, and get in with them, and mm. and you know, work with them, and and you know, make that work for you in your book. So I don't have any more questions, but I've been listening to Getting Curious with Jonathan Van Ness recently. I don't know if you've listened to that podcast. No, but But, he is wonderful. Yeah. He has this bit at the end of it, which he calls um, the like yogi's playtime, where if you've been at a yoga class and the yoga class has been focused on something that you, and actually you wanted to like go and do a headstand and you haven't had the chance to do it right um you get sort of five minutes at the end to go and do whatever it was that you wanted to say right and he uses that analogy in his podcast to say is there anything you wanted to talk about that we haven't talked about so now i'm this has got so meta now but what i'm asking you is that is there anything you want to say at the end of this video that we haven't already covered um I think keep supporting independent presses, buy books from them and their poets directly. I think, um, especially as 
poetry moves into a more commercialized commodity because it, you know it's on every advert now um which is a whole other debate <laughs> for another time um but it, you know the community isn't is still here we're still going and i think we shouldn't lose that because the community has helped a lot of people get to where they are now um and i think places like amazon and people like that they you know if you're if you're an artist and you're an independent artist and you're selling books on amazon you get 5p return for every book that you sell whereas if you sell the book yourself if you buy the book from the poet or the publisher themselves that increase that increases enormously for the poet you know the poet gets about 60 percent of it if it comes from the publisher and it um and almost 100 percent you know if it comes from from them themselves so i think really encourage people to buy books from publishers and directly from artists in and indie bookshops and, and support people's right to be independent artists because not everybody wants to be rich not everyone does it because the, it's a living people do it because they want to be part of something mm. and it makes them feel safe and a place where they can express themselves and i i don't want to lose that i don't want to see that go um if you know it continues to increase and also in the tory government i mean there's no money in the arts so you've got to support each other at the end of the day so just keep doing that yeah so with that in mind the link to burning eyes bookshop will be in the description so do go and have a look we've talked about a few of the books um here and while i was do working at burning eye admittedly my youtube channel just didn't happen but i decided that i wasn't going to review burning eye books while i was working there because yeah I conflict really... of interest i yeah. guess yeah but now that i'm not <laughs> i can get back on it again Woo! so um more reviews will be coming soon um thanks so much thanks for having me ah so nice right now we've got to do the thing where we're sipping our tea even if you've not got tea left so